So there's this tiny river just north of London that not many people know about, with almost 260 years of navigation history. Being only 14 miles long is one of the UK's smallest navigations. Today's traffic may be a little different to that of 80 years ago, but come with us as we travel this tiny river and explore its great past. We'll look at its ups and downs as it struggled to pay its shareholders, and we'll delve into each of the locks and look back at what they looked like when they were first constructed in 1766. We'll also look into the surrounding history and why this river was made navigable, and its eventual downfall. So have you guessed what river it is yet? It's the River Stalk, now part of the River Lee and Stalk Navigation. I'm going to try and do this tiny river some justice by telling its story. Not many boaters venture this side of London as there's only two rivers to choose from. My family and I have been on and off this river for a good 15 years now, and I made this video as I'd like to share a hidden little gem tucked away in the corner of our inland waterways. And to commemorate the main pioneer of the river, I've set myself the goal of painting a Buckley can before we get to the end of the river at Bishop Stortford. I also wanted to add some wildlife scenes, but they proved too fast for me. We're going to start our journey just outside Royden Marina, which is not far from the start of the river, where the River Stalk meets the River Lee. We're going to be skipping the first lock on the river because we're already here and we broke down not too long ago in that lock and we didn't want to do it twice and bring back some bad memories twice. There's not a lot going on at this lock anyway, but in case you wanted to see it, here it is. So we're going to untie from our friends that we had a barbecue with last night and get on our way. One for one. Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> set off is our first lock which has a bit of a sad story. Our first lock is Brick Lock. The last owner of the stalk was Sir Walter Gilby, famous for his gins bought the river in order to help Bishop Stortford's trade. However, in 1909, the south wall of Bricklock collapsed, trapping all but one of the river's barges on the London side of the river, causing traffic to cease. For several years beforehand, Gilby attempted to sell the river to the Lee Conservancy for a profit at £2,500. However, the Conservancy didn't want to pay more than £2,000. In the end, Gilby sold the river for five shillings, which was less than six bottles of his spirits. Today, Brick Lock is one of the only surviving original lock cottages on the river, and I just had to turn up when they were doing some maintenance to their roof. Something that might upset Gilby today is that the lock cottage sells their own cider. Best quickly taking down all the tall things as the bridges are quite low on the stall and this is the first one. They get quite a bit lower so we're going to keep them down until we come back.
but this low bridge provides a route to our next feature. This is the first mill on the river, Royden Mill. It's now the entrance to the marina. The river's main traffic was malted barley and timber downstream towards London, and grain and coal was returned towards Bishop Stortford. The river was made navigable to profit from the abundance of mills on the river, where their current mode of transport was horse and cart. One horse and two workers with a barge could pull the same as 20 to 30 carts, making river transport a cheaper option. A little bit further along is Royden Station, designed by Francis Thomas, opened by the Northern and Eastern Railway in 1844. Much like other canals around the country, the railways cause great pain to canal traffic and trade. This railway line follows the river all the way to Bishop Stortford, giving the river great competition. You can't say we didn't warn you about how low the bridges are. Before the water level was changed in this stretch, they used to be a lot lower. At the end of Royden Station is one of the lowest bridges, if not the lowest bridge, on the River Storm. On our first trip up the Storm, we didn't realise how low the bridges were and we actually got stuck under this bridge. And it's quite scary when a train goes over your head whilst you're stuck underneath it. <laughs> then just round the bend is Royden Lock. This plaque here is the oldest artefact on the river. It's a plaque of George Jackson's coat of arms, taken from the original lock house that was built here. George Jackson was the first sole proprietor of the river stall. We'll talk more about him later. It's currently willow seeding season on the river stall, and this area always ends up looking like it's covered in snow and it even looks like it's snowing sometimes. It does look lovely, but it fills your boat up with fluffy stuff like this. Between these two locks, the water level can drop and rise quite rapidly. In the winter, the area floods quite a lot, and in the summer, there's always a drought. But it doesn't bother the cormorants who are often looking for fish here. Cormorants are seabirds, but they've started coming inland to look for food. You usually find them on the dead branches of trees. We're coming up to our next lock now, which is number 12, Hunston Mill Lock. Before 1901, Hunston Mill used to be found next to the lock, but the mill was demolished in 1902. Here it is in 1901, and this is the same place a year later. And this is where the mill would have sat over a hundred years later. We're going to leave this lock now on a sharp bend towards Harlow. We blacked our boat a few months ago and I've just made a lovely scratch in it. Oh well, boat life. My family and I have very much loved this river for the past 20 years that we've been on and off it. But this river is now over 253 years old. Up next we're going to look at how and why this river was made navigable. The river's story began in a now forgotten inn called The Crown, where this row of shops now are. In 1758, Thomas Adderley, the landlord, postmaster and magistrate for the county, organised a meeting to form an Act of Parliament to make the river navigable 
from Bishop Stortford to the River Lee at Hoddesdon. The Act received royal assent in 1759, however Thomas Adderley failed to procure a loan for the work. This is where our main man comes in, George Jackson, long friend of Captain Cook, famous for discovering Australia, named Cape Jackson in New Zealand and Port Jackson after his good friend George. Port Jackson is now within Sydney Harbour. George was Deputy Secretary to the Admiralty and later Judge Advocate of the Fleet and soon was to become the sole owner of the Stort Navigation. But he wasn't always the sole owner. He, Charles Dingley and William Masterman approached the Commissioners and agreed if they attained a second Act of Parliament they would back the cost of construction. The cost of the construction was likely lost due to missing records, however one record suggests that the total cost was around £100,000, which is around £22.2 .2 in today's money, although the suggested cost could be inaccurate and a realistic cost would be £20,000. But finally, on September the 24th, 1766, the construction of the Stort Navigation was started. The river was widened, dredged, straightened in places and 15 locks were built. 13 turf-sided locks and 2 brick locks. This lock is Pardon Mill Lock. The mill at Pardon is one of the two mills from the Doomsday Book of 1066 which survived. However, much like the other mills on the river, Pardon Mill burnt down in 1897 and was rebuilt in the 1900. Before we continue, I really must mention the works of Richard Thomas and the late John Boys, who documented the history of this river on their website, theleanstort.co.uk, which has been my main source of information for these videos. When Pardon Mill was reopened as a gallery, Richard was invited to the opening and quoted Thomas Yeoman, who said, Now the town of Bishop Stortford is open to all the ports of the world, when the navigation was opened in 1969. Here's a photo of Richard and his wife Celia, who used to travel up and down the river Stort. So for the past few weeks I've been painting a traditional Buckby can to commemorate the original sole proprietor of the river, George Jackson. Even though George never really made any money from the river, he still kept it going until he passed away and passed it on to his son. Buckby cans originated from a small village called Buckby in Northamptonshire. When working boat families would pass through the village, they would purchase their cans to be used for drinking water. I've been painting these two Buckley cans, hopefully in time for the Wear Festival, which is in July. I've got two months, so I should have enough time, but let's see if I finish them in time. I learned to paint roses and castles when I attended one of Terence Edgar's canal art courses. You can find some info on his courses in the description. Not far from our last lock at Pardon is Burnt Mill Lock, hidden behind Harlow Town Station in Harlow. Oh, no, it's queer, isn't it? This area has been called Burnt Mill since 1580, but there was never a mill here that burnt down, so who really knows why it's called Burnt Mill? This is the first key operated lock on the river. So you put the key into a little box and then you press a button and the gates open for you. The lock gates on the stalk are really weird compared to other rivers I've been on. Uh, we don't have the little railings so to help you walk across them. So we have to just wing it like this. I wouldn't recommend doing this as if I fell in on the left hand side where the paddles are I could get pulled under and drowned and if I fell into my right hand side I could have a 10 foot drop. 
But at least it saved me having to walk all the way around. Leaving the lock, you can see what was Burnt Mill Station is now Harlow Town Station, which is the main train station for the town. There were no trains running today because of strikes. Or industrial action, as they call it. This was the original Burnt Mill Station. We're now coming up to the main reason why we're all boaters. That's nice. A pub. The Moorhead is a Green King pub with some really good food and some really good beer, which is likely the reason why you can never find a mooring here. The River Stort doesn't have that many pubs and taverns on the riverside like other canals and rivers on the network in the country. The building that was here previously, a couple hundred years ago, used to be an inn. But they rebuilt this building in around the 80s and it's quite a good pub. We were hoping to stop near here for the night, but seeing as there's no more in spaces and the towpath side and the other side of the river looks like this, uh, we could have a moor in the trees for the night, but seeing as Beth has got work, we decided to carry on until we found somewhere good to moor. This will have to do for the night. It's not perfect, but it will do. In this video, we didn't quite start off where we wanted to, but we got just short of halfway at Latin in Harlow. We've looked at why the river was made navigable, its mills, and why some of them are not here today. We've looked at the nearby towns and villages on the river and their history, all whilst doing five locks travelling 4.9 miles. In our next video, we'll look at some of the people that lived and worked on the river, nearby contributions to the World War, and what happened to George Jackson and the end of the river at Bishop Stortford. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to see our next video coming out the same time next week. But for now, that's all we have from me, Ashley. Me, Beth and Pennyfly.